We're live on YouTube now. You can go start. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Everybody sees it? Yes, you'll just need to enter into presentation mode. And then at the top, you'll need to swap displays. Yeah, I made a mistake of starting with my uh, big screen and the Mac gets confused. <laughs> it's working. Uh, just right up at the top, there's a thing that says swap displays. You can just click on that, uh, top left. Well, the Mac is uh, I'm getting the circle going around. Jesus. Oh, OK. <laughs> PowerPoint isn't responding. Great. Sorry. I have your old slides one. If you want, I could present them. I don't know whether you made changes. What's that? I could present your old slides. I have them here, the one you sent around. Uh, now, now I think I got something. So hang on, let me see if this works. So you guys are not seeing anything, right? Or you are? Are you seeing my first slide? Or? Yes, go ahead and use that way. Okay, hang on. Do you see a blank screen or? Do you guys see anything? Now it's the presentation mode, I think again. Uh... Oh boy. Yeah, that was my mistake. Changing, uh, switching uh, screens on top of me. Did you guys see my first uh, slide? Sort of. So can it, you present? Uh, the thumbnail thereof. Can you present, Mark Goldfin? Well, if you want, I can put the slides up that I have. Yeah, yeah, could you do that? Okay, let me do it, yeah. Uh, yeah. So how is that? Yeah, so, uh, all right. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. And welcome to PKC 2021 in virtual Edinburgh. Uh, next. All right. Uh, yeah, so I guess the order is all right. But so um, we were fortunate this time to, you know, uh, count on a very talented and energetic uh, program committee, which uh, 
you'll see on the screen and uh, next. And the help of over 250 reviewers, which will flash uh, in the next three pages, All right? And next. So this year we received um, 156 submissions out of which 52 were accepted. That's a 33% uh, acceptance rate. There were six conditional accepts, all including the program. And there was one soft merge, meaning that two papers you know, on the essentially the same topic, uh, overlapping results uh, were soft merge, meaning they're gonna share the same presentation slot and that's on uh, privacy intersection, I believe on Wednesday. All right, so the review took uh, around 10 weeks. We were a little bit constrained with time this year because we, uh, and there was, we skipped the rebuttal phase, but uh, in any case it was fairly interactive in the sense that um, in many cases, reviewers were able to ask uh, authors questions and the results, you know, the answers were automatically posted on the discussion board and so forth. And we generated almost 500 pages of uh, review discussions and authors responses. And uh, in, in terms of submissions, <clears throat> given uh, the emphasis on post quantum cryptography, NIST efforts in standardizing the this uh, area, then we, this uh, area was encouraged this year and this is somewhat reflected in the program. Uh, in terms of submissions, we use uh, Shai Halevi's, not yet. Shai Halevi's uh, reviewing software, thanks to Shai, thanks to Dimitri Karakostas for uh, starting up with the uh, conference webpage. And of course, Kevin and Kay for you know, all your help and this uh, wonderful uh, setup of uh, program, uh, uh, all the media and so forth. Next. All right, so the program at the glance, we start roughly at uh, 1300 hours UTC. And each day we have like three blocks of uh, technical talks with uh, breaks and virtual social hour at the end. Thursday, we finish uh, a little bit earlier. And tomorrow after the last uh, session of talks, we're gonna have the test of time award ceremony. Uh, next. Uh, there are two invited talks in the program by uh, Leo Ducat and uh, from CWI and IK Kilts on those uh, topics. So we are pretty, very much uh, looking forward to, to their talks. The first, the first one is today at um, in about an hour. Okay, next. There was a special arrangement. Uh, there's a special arrangement with the uh, Journal of Cryptology for uh, where the journal invites up to three papers that are selected by the program committee. And these were the three papers that were selected uh, this year and they should have for being in the process of receiving the invitations. Next. And there is a TESO Time Award that uh, PKC started uh, somewhat recently, which recognizes outstanding papers, which had to be published in PKC about 15 years ago which made a significant contribution as judged by the community and reflected by the other way, as just ju judged by a selection committee taking into account their impact, All right? So this year, the range was uh, 2002, 2005. And uh, the, the selection committee is composed typically by the current PKC program chair, the next PKC program chair, which is Gochiro Hanoka, last PKC program chair, Agilos Kiyas, and two members from the selection committee. Those are Moti Jung and Julian Zhang. And the ceremony is gonna to be tomorrow at uh, 16, 10 hours UTC. Next. And those papers, 
selected by the committee are an identity by signature from GAP Diffie Hellman groups by Zhao Chung Cha and Jung Hee Chan, an efficient signature scheme from bilinear pairings and supplications by Fang Guo Shang, Ray Safavi Naini, and Willie Susila, and a verifiable random function with short groups and keys by Evgeny Doris and Alexander Yampolsky, which I understand uh, all of them, most of them are going to be attending the ceremony. Next. And finally, thanks to our general chairs, Markov and Petros, who are now going to take it over. Thanks. Um, can you see that? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, cool. And you can also hear me. Great. So I will tell you a bit about how this practically works. Uh, for those of you who have attended IACI events uh, in the in this throughout this whole period of uh, um, yeah this difficult time, um, you will already know how how it works. Um, it's slightly adapted from last year's PKC, where it was one of the first conferences, and hopefully this will be one of the last conferences. Um, also, um, um, yeah, let's see. Um, so how will it work? Um, so the the code of conduct, I think, is especially important online because it's uh, yeah, human behavior is easier to regulate in the physical world than in the online world apparently. Um, so we so we we um, everyone should use their professional name and of course no inappropriate speech or harassment. Um, but it's good to repeat it. Um, so the recommendation is to keep your microphones muted at all times, except when asked uh, by the moderator to ask questions. Um, all sessions are recorded um, as now, um, after an announcement in the beginning. Um, so the code of conduct, uh, there's more to it, of course, than just this uh, short summary up there. So you can find it on, in, the, in the portal under this tab conduct. And this, this is kind of the whole, this portal will kind of be quite important throughout the whole conference. There's also the program and the chat. And this way you can also find um, the talks. And there's also a puzzle here um, that uh, asks you, like that's a crossword puzzle to fill in. Um, so what else is there? So the, the online material is already on the website. I think uh, Kevin will say a little bit later on how to access the papers. Um, the format is that there are short five-minute talks, which are given um, live, and uh, there are questions around that. So speakers, as in a physical conference, should kind of uh, come early to talk with the session chair. In this case, you join the Zoom room um, early on to test your setup. For instance, that screen sharing works uh, correctly. Um, so then during the session, there's a question and answers and the panel. Um, so typically there are um, few questions after each talk. Um, the questions are asked um, by raising your hand in Zoom, which you can see in the participants list. Um, you can write questions in Zoom chat or the preferred solution because that is more long-term and kind of allows more interactive uh, response is to write it in the Zulip uh, chat. And uh, the raised hands are ordered temporarily like in a regular conference. So if there are lots of questions, that's the, the right way to go go for it, I think. But uh, writing in Zulip is also good. So we will have a, a kind of one of the session chairs, the two session chairs and one of them typically will, will monitor those uh, places. So there are um, uh, social events like in a real conference, in a physical conference, um, but of course virtual. So one interesting, so Juan already mentioned that, one interesting oddity here is that every day the social event starts five minutes earlier. So you will, so that's the, the kind of you, you get to be social five minutes earlier. And then I think on the last day, actually one hour earlier. Um, you join it through um, this, this link here, join the party. And there are different rooms and uh, you can see who is in which room and you can also go for random assignment if you trust randomness more than your own choices. So yeah, let's let's um, also try to make that aspect of a conference, which I think is very important, as uh, enjoyable as possible. Maybe if you're in the right time zone, you can bring a bring a drink and uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's I think most um, of the organizational things that I wanted to go through. So last uh, but not uh, uh, so. This is how you can find the Sulip chat, which is another way of uh, of being social. And talk with colleagues that you yeah that you usually meet at conferences. 
So it's a good good way to, to interact, maybe talk with new people as well. And so last not, but not least, I want to thank our, our sponsors for their generous contributions to the conference. And uh, so I'm handing over to Kevin, I think, who wanted to say a few words. Yeah, just a, a little bit. Um, there are possibly some bugs that you'll discover in the portal software for which I hold the unique blame for that. And I'm sorry, but uh, I'd be like to hear of any problems that you experience with it. Um, we have had a problem with getting the links to the papers to work. Uh, there's some confusion about exactly how the authentication works. However, uh, I am hoping that by uh, in an hour or so, there will be a new solution for having the papers available online so you can click through to them. I've added links in ePrint articles. So if you're an author and you have a paper that's been accepted, you should upload it to um, ePrint so that I can add that link and then send an email to virtual-conferences at icr.org. And I don't think I have much else to say. If you have any questions about how things are run, you can contact Kay or myself. And I've put that email in the chat. Oh, I should perhaps mention that the YouTube channel and the Zoom room will remain constant for the rest of the day. So we, we will stay in this Zoom room uh, and uh, the sessions will be held here. Okay, great. So I think, uh, Juan, do you want to hand over to the first session? Can you share the, oh no, actually I'm stuck again, but. Um, yeah, I think it's, I can do it. So yeah, please. So the, the session chairs for the first session are Daniel Appon and Christophe Petit, and it's on post-quantum cryptography. So yeah, maybe you can take over. Oh, okay. Uh, so welcome to this uh, first, first session of PKC 2021. Um, the session is on post-quantum cryptography. We have um, six, uh, six talks. Uh, they will all be five minutes long, followed by five minutes uh, Q, uh, Q and A. So the first talk is um, a paper by uh, Julien de Vevey, Amin Saxat, Damien Stelle, and Ron Steinfeld on the integer polynomial learning with error problems. And uh, Julien will give the talk. So Julien, if you're here, you can, you can yep. slide. Hello. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So can you see my slides now? Perfect. Right. Yeah. OK. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about the integer polynomial learning with errors problem. Uh, so it is based, actually, it is a variant of the polynomial learning with errors. Uh, we call it polynomial instead of ring to emphasize the fact that it's based on polynomials. Um, the idea is to find a secret which is used in LWE samples, uh, generating, gener generated using polynomials, and to define the integer variant of it. The idea is to actually evaluate each polynomial um, beforehand, before computing the samples. And so you get the integer polynomial variant. There are a few caveats, notably since you want the secret S and E high to have small coefficients, you do some rejection sampling uh, as to not reduce the secret and E high mod F of Q because you want to keep this notion of smallness. And if you do so, our main results are that these two problems are actually computationally equivalent for a large class of uh, polynomials f. You want them to have small infinite norm and small expansion factor. And from this, we provide a one-way CPA secure public key encryption scheme under the SIPLWE assumption. So why do we do we care? The thing is, PLWE is well studied. We know that it's quantum safe, etc. But IPLWE is fairly new and not that much studied. So we want to see how different these two problems are because they look quite similar. And 
there is a module extension of the IPLWE problem, which was used in the Freebirds crypto system, which is a nice candidate to the PQC project. It made it to round two. And it's in, it's an IPLWE is an interesting problem because heuristically you expect it to have good security as PLWE, but also in terms of implementation, you can use fast large integers arithmetic and maybe get faster implementations. However, this is just a heuristic because there was no average case reductions between the two problems. Uh, this is a gap we fill. And since we can extend our results from polynomial LWE to module LWE, we are one step closer to proving a theoretical security of free birds. But Freebirds uses the decision version of the problem. To do so, we use what we call the centered QRV decomposition of an integer. The idea is to uh, write the integer in basis Q, but you take coefficients in minus Q over 2, Q over 2, instead of 0, Q minus 1. So you can also write negative integers in this QRV decomposition. And from this, you can go from the, the, the integer ring that we use by taking some representative range, and you map the integer a to the corresponding decomposition polynomial mod f. It's an interesting map because depending on whether you have uh, more integers than polynomials or the reverse, it is an injective or subjective map. And actually, to do our reduction, we say that if we had polynomials, if we are given polynomials, we evaluate them and then reduce them mod f of q. And if we have integers, then we apply this map to get polynomials for both reductions. And the idea is then in the whole paper, the rest of the paper is actually studying how, what are these distributions and how far they are from uh, the, the real distributions used in the problems. And in the end, we have a reduction statement. If we take, for instance, f to be x to the n plus 1, then if this constraint is satisfied, then we have a reduction. And to see how to make this constraint uh, true, we first it's possible to first check how many samples you want, then choose the degree of the polynomial. Then sigma prime and sigma are actually uh, parameters setting the smallness of S and E. So you then uh, set them. And finally, you choose Q to be big enough, depending on your needs, if you want very small noise or not. There is also the converse reductions is also something with the same kind of constraint. And then we have the equivalence of the problems without increasing the, no without increasing the noise uh, in any of the reductions. The tool we used to do so is called the Rainy Divergence. And it's a great tool to use for search games, but it's hard to use it for decision games. And this is why we only have results for search problems. And this is also why we only have one-way CPA security for our PKE, because it's based on a search game. Uh, but it's unclear how to expand it to decision uh, version of the, of the problems. So thank you for listening. And if you have any question, feel free to, to ask them. OK, I guess uh, making sure people have connected to Zulip or the chat at IACR and are asking questions there. I don't see any at the moment. Um, I guess I can ask, uh, you know, in the meanwhile, Julian, um, uh, you know, how much did you attempt to, you know, get a decision version um, of this uh, reduction, basically? And so, did you try anything, and did it work or not work? I mean, yeah, the 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 main obstruction is actually the rainy di the divergence, which is really not suited to to this kind of reductions. So I think our approach cannot really be extended to decision. You have to tackle the problem with a different way. One thing you could do, however, is to use spin square inequality, which gives an upper bound on the statistical distance as the square root of the log of the Rene divergence. Uh, this means that if you take what is inside the exponential and you make it negligible, then you get the, 
decision reduction, but then parameters are not that much interesting. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, great. If you have more questions later, feel free to ask. We can, you know, I guess hang out, you know, we're going quick, really quick here through these things. So we can ask questions later in the session. Um, okay, Christy. Thanks, Daniel. Now, uh, the next paper is a paper by Giovandro Pereira, followed by Reto on isogeny-based key compression without parents. And Jovandra will give a talk. Jovandra, you can upload your slides. Can you already see the screen? Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, present the isogeny-based uh, key compression without parents uh, work. Uh, this is joint work with Paulo Barreto. And um, basically, isogeny based, based key compression techniques allow you to reduce uh, key sizes from about 6 log p to 3.5 log p bits, uh, where p is the underlying prime that we are working with, uh, for example, for uh, a key encapsulation scheme. And uh, these techniques not only apply to uh, reducing key sizes, but also ciphertexts. So basically, uh, we can compress both of them with uh, about a similar factor. And this kind of techniques not only apply to KIMS, but uh, they can also apply to some isogeny based signatures. And uh, the main compression idea is that giving a public key, uh, PK uh, consisting of a triple uh, ellipse curve E and two points on that curve, P1 and P2, uh, we want to transmit a short representation of this uh, two points, for example. And uh, uh, the previous, uh, the original work would uh, transmit the X coordinates of the points P1 and P2. We are elements uh, of the quadratic extension, so um, occupying two log P bits uh, each coordinate. Uh, but it turns out that there's a, a, be a better way to transmit a representation of these points. Basically, we can note that uh, the points uh, PI can be uh, expressed or decomposed into a uh, two-dimensional uh, structure. Uh, so basically the subgroups generated by a point R and a point S, where R and S uh, is our generators for the L to the E torsion of that elliptic curve. And these points R and S are just uh, a canonical basis. So basically anyone can, can compute this basis so basically, if uh, the, the, the user that wants to uh, compress its public key, they can simply uh, co compute these coefficients a and b, uh, which together add up to just half the size of the x coordinate of the point. So basically, uh, we can transmit those coefficients. The other side can just recompute that canonical basis from e. And then we just project uh, the coefficients to get the points P, P1 and P2. Um, so basically the idea is that previous works uh, would uh, compute these coefficients. This is the hard part to, to actually retrieve these coefficients is not a cheap thing. And the way that previous works um, did that was by uh, using pairings so that we get a projection, projection of PI onto the subgroup generated by R and the subgroup generated by S. And uh, also have projected those uh, instances, you can just use pulley hellman on a smooth order uh, subgroup of the finite field of P squared, and then you can retrieve the actual coefficients. So it turns out that in this work, uh, we gave a different approach to perform this projection of the points P1 and P2 onto uh, the specific subgroups of order L to the E, but now, not over the uh, finite field, but over an elliptic curve. So basically the idea was that um, we basically can uh, get this equation one here, this expression uh, on the curve E for the points PI. And we can use dual isogenies uh, to move the problem uh, back to the very initial curve that was used in SAC before. We know how to do to compute this dual isogenies due to recent works by Nehig and Hennis, which can be done efficiently. 
So uh, we can move the problem to the very initial curve is zero uh, that has some special properties. And basically the coefficients are not changed although the points are changed on the, the initial curve is zero. And then we um, like learned that basically uh, if you use the trace map on that curve is zero, that, that map maps points onto the base field of that curve, even if the point is over the quadratic extension. And then uh, we suggested to compute two independent uh, maps on this equation two here, basically applying the trace map and the trace map composed with uh, a distortion map on that curve is zero. So that's usually not easy to find for an elliptic curve in general, this distortion map, but for zero, it's, it's known. So basically uh, we can do that in here and efficiently. And uh, also have uh, applied these two maps. Uh, what you get at the end is that uh, you get only points over uh, the base field, but the base field can be generated by a single generator G uh, of full order in that subgroup that can be pre-computed. And then uh, basically these equations, these two new equations are going to give a system of two equations and two variables on A and B. And uh, by solving just simpler discrete logarithms over this base field, and uh, then solving a system of linear equations over the integers, we can retrieve those coefficients A and B, totally avoiding uh, pairings uh, and just doing discrete logarithms over uh, the elliptic curve over the base field here. So basically that's the, the, the main idea of the paper. There's an extra contribution as well uh, that works uh, for the previous works uh, for the uh, quadratic extension of the finite field, but also in, for the elliptic curves, which is reducing pre computed tables that I don't describe in here, but we got a factor to, uh, to reduce those tables by uh, doing some, uh, applying some tricks. So basically we implemented our ideas in Magma um, and uh, for PsychP751, uh, we were able to reduce the, ta the table sizes, the pre-computed table sizes to solve these discrete logarithms by a ratio of about 28 to 20 to 28%, depending on the torsion that we're working on. And um, if you look at the uh, time in terms of uh, multiplications over the, the base field the equivalent, uh, we got uh, 24 to 48 uh, improvement when no pre-computation is used. If per comp computation is used, then our method is slower. But uh, if no per, per comp computation is required, then uh, it's a bit faster. And uh, I think that's basically what I, I had to say. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I guess if you have a question, uh, so we noticed there was a prior question that was posted. I guess it takes people a couple minutes to type, which is a little different. You don't can't raise a hand and pause um, easily. I guess you can raise a hand in Zoom. Um, let's see. So, are there are there any uh, questions uh, for Jivandra? Um, there is there is a question on the um, on the Zoom uh, chat uh, by Marcus Carvajal. What's the cost of the computation? Yeah. So uh, basically. Uh, this is the number of uh, of uh, FP equivalent multiplications over the, the finite field. Oh, you mean uh, the offline cost or the uh, the offline cost? Yes. I mean the offline cost is not uh, is just building a table of size uh, two to the m rows or l to the m depending on the torsion uh, times uh, the exponent of the the subgroup. For example, we here for psych. Uh, if you are on the, the two torsion is uh, uh, 372. And if you are on the three torsion is 239, the exponents here. So basically the, the, the size of the table is going to be 372 times two to the M in the first case or uh, 239 times uh, three to the, uh, some small number uh, W, sorry. Um, so basically uh, you just need to build a table of that size. Uh, and the table is going to store some um, finite field elements. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty quick to generate these tables, and uh, it's an offline part. So basically, 
Um, it's, it's faster than doing the online part, definitely, uh, but we do it off, offline anyways. I don't know if that uh, answers the question or... Okay, uh, I, there, there is another question, but uh, you might want to take it offline uh, on the on the Zulu chat um, by Thomas Press. What algorithm do you use to solve this simpler DDoX? So maybe you can answer that on the chat. Uh, as a reminder to everybody, uh, it's it's best to ask question in the Zulu chat rather than here on the Zoom uh, whenever possible. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Giandra, Gio Giovandra, sorry. Um, the next uh, talk is, uh, this, the next paper is an alternative approach for SIDH arithmetic. The paper is by Cyril Bouvier and Laurent Humbert, and, and Laurent will give the talk. So, Laurent. Yes. Thank you, Christophe. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, let me restart my uh, video. So just a reminder, every speaker gets in theory five minutes and then five minutes Q&A. Um, she can stick to that. my slides properly? No. Only see myself. Yeah, you should move your, your slides there. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's fine. Mm -hmm. OK, so thank you for uh, the introduction. So I'll try to uh, keep it to five minutes. So uh, we go straight to the point, and in uh, PSYC or SIDH, you need to do uh, the arithmetic over a uh, quadratic extension of FP, where P is a prime of the form 2 to the H to the B minus 1. And PSYC, that is the uh, NIST uh, proposal, uh, there are four primes that have been proposed at different security levels. Um, so the contribution of this paper is an attempt to do the uh, arithmetic in these uh, special uh, primes, uh, especially in uh, the uh, quadratic extension fp square, faster. So for that, we uh, use a different representation for the elements. So for example, if you want to represent an element v that belongs to fp square, we're going to do that with integer polynomials uh, with bounded coefficients, uh, such that this number v will be represented by a polynomial u, such that when evaluated at the gamma, uh, it will give my v. For uh, a fixed gamma, that is um, a value that belongs in uh, belongs to fp square. So the uh, given this representation, so no polynomials, uh, we do the arithmetic by simply uh, adding or multiplying uh, two polynomials mod e, where e is another integer polynomial that vanishes at gamma. Um, and of course, when we do these uh, operations, uh, for example, you can think of uh, polynomial multiplication, the uh, coefficient of my output polynomial will grow. Uh, and then we need to find a way to reduce this coefficient to stay within the boons, bounds that we uh, set at the beginning. So for, for that, we need a few things. We need a, a, a M that is also a polynomial that represents zero, just like E, and M prime, which is the inverse of M in, in summary. And the way we do the um, polynomial, uh, the coefficient reduction is uh, very similar to the classical Montgomery re reduction uh, applied to uh, the Q coefficient of our polynomials. So if you take C, uh, a polynomial with large non-reduced coefficient, for example, the, uh, for example, the result of a multiplication, uh, you can get a representation of C divided to some well-chosen power of two by doing the usual Mon Montgomery uh, multiplication, you add the correct multiple of m, that is a representation of zero, and then you can uh, you can divide by two to the omega. And if you do that, you need the uh, big O of n square multiplication is if n is the degree of your polynomials. What we uh, present in the paper is a special way to a uh, special subset of the uh, what we call the PMNS basis, the uh, polynomial representation, where the polynomials n and m prime that are here are very sparse and have small coefficients. And also, the in this case, the um, and, there, and there are some conditions that are not so difficult to satisfy. The digits of Q and R also satisfy a recurrence relation, so that we can now implement the Montgomery reduction in big O of n multiplications. 
So uh, because we have five minutes, let's go to the uh, the results. Uh, of course, our uh, code is available. At, if you follow this link, uh, what you get if you download the code is you get a psych, the original psych, where we added uh, layers for the arithmetic for two primes, the uh, original psych P503, and we give two variants using our polynomial representation, and a new prime uh, that we call P736. And we compare that to the original uh, uncompressed implementation uh, of psych that you can download here. So just for uh, one result, this uh, new prime that we proposed is this, this number. Uh, it can be represented with the degree three polynomials with a coefficient that fit into three uh, 64 bit words. Uh, so it's slightly smaller than psych P751, but in the same order of magnitude for if we look at the um, security level. So in this table, we give the number of clock cycles for the basic uh, arithmetic operation uh, mod P. So we see that our Montgomery reduction that corresponds to the equation redu reduction is, uh, is very, very fast. Uh, and overall, the uh, arithmetic mod P is faster. And it also translates to the arithmetic over FP squared. And we didn't give the result in this five minute talk, but the overall speed up for psych algorithm uh, signature or, um, oh, sorry, uh, encryption or key exchange is about 17%. And to be sure I stay within my five minutes, uh, we believe that this way to represent the an element of a finite field for psych is advantageous. Uh, we also know that we only scratched the surface of this field. Uh, we need to find more good primes. In particular, we need to find uh, efficient basis for FP square uh, directly. And I will and my presentation now. Great, thank you. Um, looking for questions for Lauren. Um, and also I'm gonna just point out, uh, just for the sake of time, uh, Julian and uh, Giovandro, there are questions for you in the, um, in the chat, uh, .ai, AICR here, a um, couple of them there. So we'll leave those offline. Any questions for Lauren? Okay, well, let's, uh, in that case, take uh, any questions you have for him to the chat and he can answer them um, later, um, you know, Thank you for the for the great work. Uh, speeding up psych is is very valuable. Um, okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, if there are further questions, we and and we have some time in the end, we can also take them after after all the talks. Uh, the next talk in this session is a paper called Anal "Analysis of Multivariate Encryption Schemes: An Application to to Dub." Uh, the paper has been invited uh, to the Journal of Cryptology. Um, so it was considered uh, one of the best papers of the conference. Um, the paper is by Martin Ogarten, uh, Patrick Felke, and Harvard Redham. I hope I'm pronouncing properly. And uh, Martin will give a talk. So Martin, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so let me see, do you see the screen now? The presentation? Yeah. Right. So uh, the paper focuses on. <clears throat> Wait, we, we see your screen. We don't see your slides. Ah, you don't see my slides. Yeah, just oh, wait just a second. Yeah, we see browser. the chat. chat. Let me. Yeah, here we go. Right now, now you see it. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. That's <laughs> always something. Right. So the paper focuses on multivariate encryption schemes, um, and particularly uh, the Dob encryption scheme. And the contribution is sort of twofold. So first of all, we we talk about how not only to uh, determine the first full degree, but also the number of degree four polynomials that we get there. Um, and secondly, we sort of use this information in order to develop an attack, a new attack against this scheme. So we also believe that these ideas could be used uh, for other multivariate sort of big field constructions as well. Um, 
sorry. Yeah. So the setting is that you will have your public key will be the quadratic polynomials, and they are constructed sort of using these f polynomials, uh, the sort of unmodified system. So they will come from one of these big field constructions. So in our case, this will mean that they can be in, um, it can be inverted if you have a secret key. However, this sort of system be, um, causes there to be these degree fold polynomials. Um, meaning that there will be combinations of polynomials uh, that will have a smaller degree than what you would normally expect. Um, so unfortunately, if this is kind of without any modifiers, this will mean that it's insecure because it's that much easier to compute Grebner basis here, <clears throat> which is why you would want to add these sort of modifier polynomials. So these will be quadratic polynomials, secret polynomials that you add on top of it. Um, and sort of the dub case would be the, that the FIs will come from uh, the WT permutation and uh, the modifiers will be internal perturbation and Q plus modifier. So the key contributions is that we are able to derive exact formulas for the number of degree fold polynomials uh, up to degree five. <clears throat> and they are exact in all of the experiments that we have run. Uh, moreover, uh, if you sort of fix uh, variables to zero, um, we call it projecting, then the, these uh, formulas will sort of remain exact to us. They do kind of predict the number of degree for, uh, degree for polynomials. And the first fold degree may also uh, decrease as a result of this. <clears throat> uh, so what we find is that if you do sort of project the polynomial system and then go up and compute these degree for polynomials, then you would be able to learn sort of these secret modified polynomials, so the kind of localized versions of them after they have been projected. So the idea of the attack is that if you kind of project along different sets of these variables, then you kind of you find these localized versions of the secret modified polynomials, and then you're able to kind of glue them all together to, to really get this, this uh, whole polynomial back. Um, and the reason why we want to project this is um, the, the, there's two reasons for that. First of all, as we see in uh, say point two here, uh, there may be kind of a smaller first fold degree, meaning that you only have to go up to a smaller degree. And secondly, there will be sort of less variables in the system and that much more easier to compute for an attacker. So I think for uh, the 80-bit parameter um, parameters, we're able to kind of project over half the, uh, half the variables and then compute. Uh, and do note that we are really just setting them to zero. So there's no guessing involved. There's no sort of exponentially many times you have to do this process. So sort of the brief summary is that we are able to break the suggested parameters for 80-bit security for the DOP encryption scheme. Um, so what we retrieve will be for the internal perturbation, we retrieve sort of the whole modifiers. For the Q plus, we retrieve sort of the quadratic part so you can find more information about that in the paper. Uh, we believe that these ideas could also be applied to other uh, big field constructions, other central maps like C-star and HFE, and other kind of popular modifiers uh, in this setting. And particularly effect, effective against encryption schemes. Uh, for signature schemes, you can, where you can kind of apply a lot of these minus uh, modifiers that would be able to kind of thwart the attack. Yes, so that's sort of the, the paper in a nutshell there. Okay, thank you. Oh, I was muted there, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Daniel, sorry. Oh, sure, sure. Um, so on the this this prior talk, so um uh do we have any questions there for uh for Morton? I guess the audience is being particularly quiet today. If it's early or something for someone. <laughs> Okay, great. I guess, you know, so one of the questions I might ask uh, Morton just uh, just to get, you know, some kind of discussion is, um, have you have you tried looking at other schemes uh, with your technique uh, that you just developed and whether you're able to pull any bits of security off of anything else or, or if you have an idea of like what might be a very interesting direction to look at because you named a couple of the options, right? Hmm. Yeah, so, um, well, I mean, initially what we wanted to do was go ahead and look at these, um, I mean, the gem schemes that I would be, HFE will be minus. Um, 
but that has unfortunately been broken by what is probably, at least for this scheme, a better attack. Um, but I, I think it would have been interesting. I mean, it, it would have given you something interesting about kind of algebraic attacks if, if we had kind of chosen that, that route. Um, I think there's also, um, we could go back. So if you want another example, um, we did a um, kind of a previous uh, paper on, on uh, E-flash, so it would be, um, Using the C star with with minus and projection, um, and I think you could kind of really improve the attack there. So that would be sort of another another example um, that, that you could go. Um, yeah, I think that's okay. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, um, are there more questions? Or move forward. All right. So the, the next talk in the session is, is about um, a paper called Multivariate Public Key Crypto Systems from Sidon Spaces or Sidon Spaces, I'm not quite sure. Um, the paper is by Nathaniel Raviv, Ben Langton, and Ijak Tama. And um, Nathaniel will give the talk. Thank you, Christoph. Can you hear me okay? See my slides? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Sure. We don't see you. And the slides? Yeah, we see the slides. We don't see you. Don't see I, me? I, I see him at the top. It's just a uh, zoom. Oh, yeah. No, I see you. Sorry. I'm All right. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. I'm glad to be here. I'm going to be uh, briefly talking about a new multivariate public key crypto system that is constructed from a fairly new algebraic concept called C on Spaces. A seed on set is a set of positive integers um, such that if you have two pairs of this set that their sums coincide, then they must be the same pair. In other words, if you are given a sum of two elements from the set, you can identify the sum uniquely. In this field of study, the main question is what is the largest T, meaning the size of the seed on uh, set, could be with respect to the range M. Obviously, the range has to be large enough to contain all distinct pairs, and matching constructions exist. In this talk, we're going to discuss crypto applications of a variant of seed on set called seed on space that can be seen as a multiplicative and linear algebraic variant of seed on sets. Seaton spaces were defined for pure mathematical research around 2015 and have found the applications in uh, network coding a few years uh, afterwards. The subspace V of an extension field FQ to the N over a base field FQ is called a Seaton space. If you take any two pairs of elements from it and multiply them, if the uh, results of the product coincide, then these must be the same pair up to multiplication from the base field. Again, in other words, if you are given the result of the multiplication, you can determine the identity of the uh, pair uniquely up to multiplication from a scalar from the base field. Where is the scalar coming from? Since you can always squeeze an element from the base field into the product and the product won't change. In this field of study, the main question is how large uh, the element K, which is the dimension of the seed down space B with respect to M, to N, sorry. A similar counting argument as we just saw show that N has to be at least two K. And a construction by me and my collaborators from a few years ago achieves that. Remarkably um, simple this construction is without getting into technical details. This is give or take, uh, take gamma, which does not lie in the intermediate field FQ to the K. And this would be a seed on space, which achieves the um, upper bound on K. Intuitively, for any two elements in a seed on space B, if you wish to factor the uh, product AB to its constituent elements A and B, you must know the seed on space B. This calls for applications in public key cryptography. Alice would choose a secret key, which would be a seed on space B. 
she will publish something, some public key, that A, keeps the seed on space B private, and B, enables the sender to compute products in B. The sender will then encrypt his, uh, map his message into two elements, perform the uh, encryption, which would be the multiplication of these two elements, again, without knowing the seed on space B. Alice, when she get this product, would be able to factor A, B to A and B, since she knows the seed on space. And Eve will not be able to do that since she does not know um, the subspace uh, B. I can get into more details given the time constraints, but I would only say that the resulting system is a multivariate crypto system where solving uh, this uh, attack amounts to solving a non-homogeneous bilinear system over FQ. We analyze the hardness of the system in a few aspects. Normally, multivariate crypto systems are broken by min rank attacks in one of uh, two formulations, either the kernel formulations, also known as Shamir thickness, or the minor formulation. In this paper, we show that in both these formulations, the attacks succeed only with exponentially small probability. And we support these findings with experiments, as well as discuss specialized attacks that are not of these two forms. I must disclaim that we uh, are not claiming any breakthrough in post-quantum post cryptography here. Uh, we only show that these attacks fail and we don't have a hardness proof for the CDOM crypto system in general. If you'd like to hear more about how Alice publishes her secret seed on space or about how can Bob compute products in this secret seed on space without knowing it, or why do we believe that kernel or minor min rank attacks fail? You're invited to watch the full talk or ask me in any forum. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I guess uh, I can ask if there are any questions as before. Um, one of the questions I had um, when I read this paper uh, was whether you had uh derived i guess recommended parameters like concrete parameters and said oh you know here are the exact numbers for 100 bits of security or something like this uh no we did not do that uh we do however have experiments of the um the straightforward grubner basis attack and how long does it take as a as a function of the um, the parameters q and k of the system okay Any further question? Okay. Um, well, in that case, we'll we'll switch to the last talk of the session. Um, this is about a QCCA secure generic key encapsulation mechanism with tighter security in a quantum random oracle model. Uh, the paper is by Shu Liu and Mingxiang Wang and Xu Liu will give the talk. Okay, uh, my talk is about the key in solution mechanism. Uh, usually we get a strong secure key M from a weak secure PKE by a generic transformation such as the Fisaki Akamoto transformation. It can be decomposed into two transformations named U and T. They have tight reduction in the random oracle model, while it's not that in the quantum random oracle model. Especially, they have square root advantage loss. Until last year, Kuchita and all uh, give an improved one way to hiding lemma named the measure rewind measure one into hiding. Then the loss is reduced to about D for the transformation U. Uh, Saito et al. Uh, gave, one, gave another way to achieve CCA security. They introduced a new security notion named the DS uh, for PKE scheme. Uh, and they showed that 
a variance of transformation u named uh, SXY can turn can tightly turn DSCQR PKE into CCACQR KI. And they, sh they give two transformations named the KC and the T-Punk that turn one way of CPACQR PKE into DSCQR PKE. However, they all suffer from the square root advantage loss. Besides, they require the underlying PKE to be perfectly correct. Next year, they sh they showed, uh, they proved that uh, the SXY even can turn DS security into QCC security tightly. Uh, QCC is a stronger security than CCA. It allows the adversary to make quantum queries to the decapitation oracle. In, in our work, we reduce the security loss of KC to a ball D. Uh, using the memory one memory one to hiding lemma. Once more, we remove the requirements of perfectly correctness. And we proved that the combined transformation as X, Y, K, C, and T can turn any CP secure PKE into QCC secure KI with loss about D squared. The so combined transformation as X, Y, and K, C can turn any one VCP secure deterministic PKE into QCC secure KM with loss of body. We combine advantages of pre previous works and uh, our proof don't need uh, other requirements. Uh, we analyze K, C in two cases. Using uh, the my uh, run my run into hiding. So, uh, the first case is uh, the underlying D DPK is derived from T. The second case is that it's a general delta correct DPK. We know that the correct correct is not notion uh, we use is in the standard model. It doesn't apply to the DPK the randomized the from T. Uh, to to deal with the correctness error, we we use a modified DS notion and we use an event to separate some bad cases in the proof. We say a PKE scheme is DS secure if there exists a simulator S satisfying the following two requirements. Uh, in our proof to cooperate with the bad event we defined before, we remove the maximum in the in, in statistical disjointness and consider it in the average case. Then the disjointness can be proved. The cipher text in distinguishability can be proved using the memory one memory one to hiding. Then, uh, it it can transform it can it can transform a DS distinguisher into a willingness attacker against the underlying DPK. For the transformation SXY, we also consider it in two cases corresponding to the proof of KC. Case two has been proved and case one can be proved based on its proof. Specifically, we insert two intermediate games uh, where we replace the function G from transformation T with G prime that only all simple good randomness uh, so, so that the decryption is always correct. Then the proof of case two can be reused. Now, combining with the results of T, K, C, and the S, X, Y, we can get the final result. That's all. Can you mute it? Uh, thank you. Thank you, you again. <laughs>
Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, you know, um, so I guess we're going to wait and see if anyone else has questions for Zhu here. Um, I guess I'll let everyone know that there's a, there's a lot of chat happening in uh, uh, the, the chat function there. Um, I think this is a question. Great. I think this is a question from uh, Markov for Zhu. Do you think that tightness matters in practice? Example, for standardization, how would you make the case? So that's a question for Zhu. Uh, question, can, can I repeat it? Yeah, the question is, do, uh, do you think that the tightness of these transformations uh, matters in practice? Or is it, you know, I guess the, the alternative would be, is it, is it more of theoretical interest? Uh, uh, what is, what is uh, your position? Uh, the, you, you see the tightness, uh, is the tightness, uh, Uh, is uh, is the tennis important in the practical? Yes. Is that's a question. Uh, I think uh, yes. So I guess uh, his question is, how would you make the case for that? Uh, sorry, my English is not so good. <laughs> That's good. Uh, I guess we can we can take it offline and you can uh, answer them there in written. Um, and uh, you know, I, I guess I can I can comment that uh, yes, it it seems to matter in practice. Um, although, you know, um, it's it's of course nicer to have a tight reduction. Um, in particular, uh, if you just analyze a reduction, you're you know some kind of transformation you're already using, and you know, lo and behold, it you know you get a you get a tight proof. Um, yes, this matters and it's helpful. Um, if you have something that's not tight. Uh, you know, I guess you could always just, you know, cross your fingers and hope that it's not a problem, right? <laughs> uh, which sometimes this actually happens in practice. You just kind of assume that, uh, that, that the tightness is, is okay. And you set your parameters, assuming that it's tight, even if it's not. So it's uh, kind of there. Um, I guess we have time for... When there are real attacks, like where you can show it, this, there was no tight proof. And yes, there was a, an attack later on. It was a real problem. So yes, but, that, but let's take it offline. It's very interesting. Sure. Yeah. Plot. Be a fun discussion. I think the other questions have been answered in the chat. Don't see any. Seems so, and I'm sure people will be online throughout the day, throughout the conference, to answer more questions if anything else comes up. So. Thank you. So there is a coffee break now, and then uh, followed by an invited talk session at. Uh, Three, well, 2.30 